And now to introduce today's host. Phyllis Tuckerman is an arts writer based in New York and is currently in Brooklyn. Over to you, Phyllis. Ah, Sophia, okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Brooklyn Rail event. Uh, those of you who have either seen me on a panel or heard me interview an artist in public know I like to begin with a short introduction. So here goes. When someone says the name Dorothea Rockburn, I'm not sure we all have the same image in our mind's eye. I know I always picture an artwork that isn't representative of her career, which spans more than five decades. Catherine, can I have the first image? Thank you, the next one. This wall work from 1980, currently on view at Dia Beacon, is what pops into my head. Why? Years ago, when I was teaching at Williams College, a friend told me that if her house caught fire, she'd grab her rock burn, which was a print very much like this. Talk about loving something you own. If you need the material, still, if you read the materials the artist used to execute this piece, you'll see it's not as simple as it looks. It's comprised of Conte crayon, pencil, oil, gesso, and white paint, all on folded linen. Nevertheless, when I stand in front of Egyptian painting Sahura, which we'll all be able to do again, hopefully soon at Dia Beacon, I respond to its purity. Can I have the next image, please? It's a far cry from Rockburn's first solo show at the Bicare Gallery, where she literally made art from schmutz. Check out Disjunction Or, executed only 10 years earlier. It occupies an amazing amount of wall space, though its dimensions are variable, and the pigment is crude oil. Can I have the next one? Here, a detail from another work currently installed at Dia Beacon belongs to an entire room plus the entryway leading into it. You need to look down. It's kind of unconventional, which was par for the course in 1970. We have the next one. Now, what about Arena Three? a painting from 1978. It stems from a prolonged visit Rockburn made to Giotto's Chapel in Padua, made with vellum paper, mylar tape, varnished, and colored pencil on rag board. It's an abstraction that relates to the experience of an interior featuring scores of narrative frescoes here reduced to their essence. May have the next. And then seemingly out of nowhere, Rockburn, by the end of the decade, was executing bright, colorful, shaped canvases. Pascal, The State of Grace from 1987, was made with oil paint and gold leaf. How can, how can we ponder there being a typical rock burn, crude oil to gold leaf. Rock burn, may have the next, was commissioned to make work for Philip Johnson's once controversial Sony building. She responded by painting two gigantic 30 foot square site specific murals in 1993. She wanted to bring the cosmos inside the building by tracing aspects of the electromagnetic field as it exists in the solar system in the northern and southern hemispheres. Fortunately, I'm only an art critic and not a scientist. I just need to know 
I like these. May I have the next? In this cursory tour of Dorothea Rockburn's art, I wanted to end up with the here and now, that is, her recent paintings. Related drawings are included in Michael Rosenstein's recent gift to the Met, which will still be on view at the Met Breuer when our lives resume. They're small and delicate, and you're aware of color and the wire lines attached to their surfaces. Let's start here. Dorothea, why are these paintings so much smaller than earlier ones? Well, that's partly the material. I have the wire comes small and when you get bigger, thicker with the wire, uh, it, it just doesn't uh, behave very well. It's not easy to manipulate, but these works will, the next works I've slated get for this series get slightly bigger. Um, and there's one or two in the works now. Um, did, did they take as long to execute as large paintings? Well, with all of my work, there's a lot of research involved. And the name of this work is Tree 4L3. And Tree 4L is a particular kind of knot from knot theory. And I've been studying knot theory since I was 18 years old, believe it or not. And, uh, um, Finally, it started to come out in my work in various ways, first in drawings, and then I began to envision this work. And, and that's where I am now. And why did it take so long for you to, to uh, because you, you've been engaged with mathematic, mathematics for so long, why did it take so long for the not theory to pop up? I think perhaps I began to understand it better as time went on, but I, I had also involved doing a lot of math along the way in order to understand it, to solve certain equations and so on. Don't be impressed. It's, it's sort of simple stuff. <laughs> but but um, it's, it's also, not theory has a beauty to it, and I've always known that deep within my soul. Uh, but, you know, there was a lot of work that I had to do first before I could get to this. That's said like a true artist. <laughs> um, Catherine, can we have the next image? And, and so now... Three-foil one, I think. Yeah. Why red? Hmm. I think uh, because I am a visual person and I think I sort of see the visual aspects of everything I do in my mind's eye and, and then I just execute what I already know and I knew red. I knew it was red. See, I was so fascinated in, in, in going over the material for today. Um, including this catalog from the parish of your show there, um, that you're able to go between white and pale and suddenly a burst of color. When you do this, is it an emotional experience? Is it, 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 it are you reacting to the color? How does color come into mathematics? I don't know how color comes into mathematics, but my early training in Montreal was at a called the Beaux Arts, where you really learned about materials. We had to grind our own pigments and things like that, and that became uh, we had to do the Munsell color wheel, if you know what that is, and uh, we, you you really understand how colors go together and how they relate to each other and what grays them and what brightens them and how they are naturally. And that is really part of who I am as that early Beaux-Arts training. And yet, you know, well, we'll get back to that. Um, I was kind of curious because didn't, oh, can we have the next one also? Another painting. 
Uh, I was kind of curious, didn't you make these paintings while you were working on the DIA installations that feature, in some case, room size reconstructions from early in your career? Like, how do they, do they relate to your early work that you were involved with at the time? Yes, uh, they definitely relate to that. Um, this is done with chipboard and a lot of the Dia show is done with chipboard, but also where art is concerned, I don't really see art, my art or many other artists locked into time. I think that um, the mathematics uh, makes it all continuous mathematics as I understand it and use it in my work. So when you say mathematics and using it in your work, um, would one plus 783, would that be like two figures, like two people? Is it, is it physical for you, those numbers? Hmm. Good question that I don't quite know how to answer. <laughs> uh, I, the, when you work mathematically, it's really a discovery. A discovery the way art is a discovery. And it's, in other words, you're uncovering systems which somehow or other are already in place. And I've always made the analogy since I studied at Black Mountain with looking at nature and understanding nature is not very different than looking at mathematics and understanding mathematics. Once you, this is higher mathematics, the stuff you learn in high school is boring. <laughs> I'm not sure. That's all you need. <laughs> I had to take physics in college, so let's let's put that in there too. I, I don't get any of it. Okay. <laughs> I got tutored and got an A, but without the tutor, oh my God. Um, uh, Catherine, can we have the next? Uh, okay, this is one of the works at um, Dia Beacon, um, and the next, and here's Dar. Uh, okay. So another work at Dia Beacon. So my question is, did unorthodox materials generate the work you showed in your first solo show at the Bicare Gallery? In other words, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I think they rather came together because the art world was very different then, and it was really quite social in a different way. There were places where artists went to eat, drink, and talk, like Mud Club and Max's Kansas City. And we were tossing these ideas around about how to cut through what, were, uh, what was the formalism of the day and how to really cause a revolution. And, you know, Flavin was working with light and... Uh, Jed was redefining the terms of sculpture and it was very much in the air but it was also in my air because um, I again from Beaux-Arts had this love and familiarity with great paper and that went into my work and also thinking of mathematics occurring in sheets and art occurring in sheets isn't too different one from the other. Um, can we have the next and, oh wow, that's better than what I gave you. Um, this is a museum of modern art, uh, carbon paper work installation. We couldn't paint the floor white there because obviously the traffic is, it would be obliterated in an hour, as they told me. So we put a couple of works on platform, but I actually prefer the Dia installation because when you go into the room, 
because the floor is white, your body is totally disoriented and you, you experience light and darkness in a different way than you can ordinarily under any other circumstances. I have to say at Dia Beacon, where you have to put the booties on, I, I hesitated from putting the booties on and it wasn't until my second visit that I did it and it was like so extraordinary. Um, it was an amazing it, room to be in. Now, yeah, yeah, the booties were. You become geometry. You're in a room full of geometry and you become part of that geometry. I love it. Can we have the next one? Okay, so now Bob Morris once described to me a place near Canal Street where whole floors were filled with felt that you could buy. And as I mentioned to you yesterday, I once stepped on a mirror corner piece that's now in the Philadelphia Museum um, by Smithson and I broke it. And I was sent to a place near the Bowery to buy a new mirror. Did you purchase supplies from similar small businesses? Well, the crude oil came from across the street in the hardware store. You can't buy it anymore because it's used in uh, homemade bomb making. So it's, and even though I, Dia tried to get it as an art supply, we couldn't, we couldn't get it. Um, so it's crude oil and chipboard and paper. Now, as I said, I have a love of paper and paper products, so I use them a lot throughout my work as units. Dorothea, um, there, there are probably people listening who never met Klaus Curtis. Can you say something about Klaus and the bike care gallery and how special it was to you? Well, the Bikert Gallery was the gallery when I was young. I mean, it was avant-garde. It was young, radical artists. And Klaus was very, very bright, very bright. And he had a great eye. And he really wanted to be surprised by every show. And I think he was. And all of the artists in the gallery were just fantastic. I mean, some of them, unfortunately, have been lost in time um, because they died young and they didn't have any money to have their work taken care of. But Bill Bollinger, for instance, was extraordinary. And for one of the shows that he did, he just made a cone of graphite in the middle of the gallery. Paul Mogensen is a great painter and is still working and now shows with Karma Gallery on the Lower East Side. Um, and he, he was doing radical paintings then and, and still is doing pretty radical work. He, for instance, will never place his work in time. He never dates anything or signs anything or titles anything. And that's sort of an interesting approach to how, how you define an object or how an object defines itself. Uh, and that fascinated me. Bryce Marden, of course, was doing incredible paintings then and is still doing incredible work. Very wonderful painter. And he was showing this emotional and radical work at the time. Uh, Richard Van Buren, who now shows uh, in Chelsea, uh, uh, lives in Maine, was doing amazing the structured work, but structured both in a rhythmic and yet illogical way. Fantastic artist. Can we have the next image, please? Okay, so uh, the next few works, I'm, I'm wondering, did you travel to see the world or were you looking to experience certain artworks firsthand. And I'm thinking of Egypt, Padua, and Tintoretto in Venice. And well, when I, well, when I was young, Phyllis, as you know, I couldn't travel because I had a child and I was a single mom. Um, have a wonderful daughter, Christine. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, she was in college that I could travel. And then I spent a lot of time in Padua and Italy, I, I showed in Italy and I 
I spent the better part of 10 years in Florence and studied everything that was there in the libraries and so on. But I also uh, was at the American Academy in Rome where I spent three months and studied Rome. And, and then in 1980, I went to Egypt with a group of archeologists and they could all read hieroglyphics. So it was very interesting to me that we would arrive at a um, statue and they would be looking at the bottom of it and I'd be looking at the top of it. <laughs> it was a wonderful trip. I had a lot of fun. And Bob Breyer, who is a well-known Egyptologist, uh, led the trip. And it, it still resonates in all of my work, that trip. There's still some, some part of that aesthetic I retained happily. Well, I think Fong put it on, on Instagram that you were amazed by the light in Egypt and how it was overhead. Yes, because uh, there are no shadows, at least not when I was there, which was the beginning of January. There are no shadows. And that's kind of an amazing experience. Plus the yellow of the desert picks up the light and and at night, and now they, unfortunately, the pyramids are lit up, but when I was there, they weren't. And so they were surrounded by bright stars. <laughs> and at night, that was just fantastic. And one time I went with some other friends on a camel ride around the pyramids and through the desert at night, and it was a spectacular experience. Wow. Um, can we have the next? Uh, I love going from from what was just on the screen now to the paintings you showed at Andre Emmerich, where you even painted um, the, the walls of the gallery. Tell me, Dorothea, what has been the appeal of making abstract art all these years? Well, I think I don't you know, no a straight answer for that. It's kind of historical. Um, I, I always loved geometry, loved it. And I would say amongst other things, Max Day in my math teacher at college was a geometer and he drew on the board all the time. And as the mathematics that I learned re unfolded itself, I, uh, really became more and more intrigued by complex projective geometry. Now this isn't projective geometry, but I took a lot of, I took a lot of license with various kinds of geometry. And uh, I just love, I think the world is, is geometric anyway. Mm. And so are we. We're all golden mean, as you probably know. Can you explain that? A little bit. Our bodies are our golden mean, you know, from our, 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 for instance, from our wrist to our hand is a measurement of the gold. It's hard to do it on, <laughs> do it without a board <laughs> to chalk on, but, but you know, you could, you know, th those draw. Leonardo made the drawings all based on that knowledge. I'm not sure what the next slide is, so. Uh, let's stay with this for a minute. Um, how important is size for you? And working small, working large? Does size matter? Yes, size matters. Ideas seem to come to me in their own size. You know, and I, I it has, probably has something to do with, you know, I am a relatively small person, I'm, uh, five feet high and 124 pounds, you know, I'm, but I'm strong. I've always been strong. I did a lot of athletics when I was young. Um, and so I, I'm sure that that's a factor as compared to a man who would naturally go into maybe uh, 10 by 12 foot paintings. That doesn't seem appropriate to my body. Can we, uh, Catherine, can we have the next? Okay, and do, do is there an, another image of Sony after that? Yeah. Okay. So, Dorothea, 
are you constantly teaching yourself time honored techniques or would you say that you prefer inventing new ones i think i don't invent techniques i um i am an ecole de beaux art artist you know i'm my the materials heritage is, you know, 500 years old and, and you know, or, or more. It's actually uh, eliminate, uh, uh, emanating from uh, Egypt through Greece, through Italy, to me, <laughs> France, and then me. <laughs> and so this is, uh, this is a secco fresco. In other words, a, 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 about a quarter inch of plaster has been applied to dry plaster board and then with using a secco te uh, fresco technique the uh, the pigment has sunk into that quarter inch of plaster so you must be thrilled with the michael rosenstein's gift at the map royer because it goes back to coro and delacroix and a whole the whole lineage well, the thing that thrills me most about that show is really Michael and I've been friends for about 50 years. Uh, his name is Rubenstein, Phyllis. Right. Um, uh, we've been friends a very long time and I met he and his wife. They came to look at my work in my studio. I didn't know them then and they bought a Tearful Sisters, which is in that, that show, out of my studio. And I never sell work out of my studio. I, I'm not a salesperson, and but you know that it was it was great, and we became friends, and we um, have looked at a lot of shows together. And Michael has, you know, shared with me his newest treasure whenever he's bought it, and uh, and I think to see a collection like that, where the only motivation for it is not reselling it or being famous for the collection. He didn't even want to show it. The Met talked him into it. It's none of that. He uh, just had an absolute physical, emotional, mental need to buy this work and live with it. And so it's an exhibition about passion. Each work is passionately done and the whole collection is passionately made. And boy, is that ever refreshing <laughs> just to see raw emotions out there. If, 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 if we talk about the Sony murals for a moment, did it take you a long time to paint them? Not very long to paint them, but it took two years to do the preliminary studies for them uh, and to understand I mean I've always been interested in the electromagnetic field and to understand the confluence of energies that could occur in this work while uh, considering the patterns of the electromagnetic field that was that was a, a tough not to crack for me because at that time I didn't know as much math as I know now. I knew a lot, but not, you know, I, I always keep one or two or three mathematicians, you know, at hand that I can ask, you know, well, how do you do this? How do you do that? Because I often don't know how to do it. And at that time, that's what I was doing. I was consulting almost daily with somebody here or there. But um, the end result so for me is to have a passionately visual understanding of how nature can work and that's what this does so when you when you look up at the night sky which is hard to do in manhattan although i gather it's easier Mars now <laughs> you can see venus right now <laughs> um yes uh uh, what do you see when you look up at the night sky? Well, for instance, the work that Michael Rubinstein bought called Tearful Sisters was the result of watching the Pleiades 
the falling stars that occur in August. And that comes from a Greek myth, uh, the Tearful Sisters, something about uh, some god threw his daughters out of the heavens or something, and that's the Tearful Sisters. And I just um, was so interested in that. I had a, I rented a house in Bridgehampton in those days, and I would lie in the yard at night and just watch the stars fall. And often I did it with friends. I, once I remember uh, Barbara Schwartz and I one night were just doing, and, and his, her husband were doing that, you know, all night long. And, and it was just, a, and drinking, of course, <laughs> drinking wine and looking at the stars fall. Well, you know, I did that for about 10 years. And then, of course, this, this work came out of that. And the work relating to the Greek, Greeks is on papyrus. I mean, to the Egyptians, it's on papyrus. It's drawn on papyrus. And so how do you end up with yellow and red and not blue and green? Well, it has something to do with sunlight, of course. You know, the configuration of the sun and in the heavens and how all that works. When you talk about research, how do you research? Do you go to the library? Do you buy books? Um, do they have lots of footnotes? I used to uh, go to the library and I'd spend whole mornings uh, in the New York Public Library re researching, but of course now we have the internet and boy is that ever great. Um, and um, it's easy to research something and also YouTubes, like with knot theory, there's a lot on YouTubes about on YouTube about knot theory. And one of the things that interests me about it is the mathematicians are drawing and not unlike artists, they have a, 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 an image in their head of a knot. So when they draw it on the board, they are recording something they see in their mind's eye, just like we are. We artists are. And you did Sony such a long time ago would you return to the building from time to time to see what you had done? Yes, and uh, uh, unfortunately, after Mickey Schulhoff was no longer the director of Sony, um, they let it go to hell. They didn't light it, they put things in front of it, and every time I saw it, I would weep. But now, this marvelous company has bought the building, uh, and they are doing a large renovation, but while they're renovating, it's all protected. It's all under plywood. And then, <coughs> excuse me. And then when it gets, when that floor is renovated, they will clean it and relight it with proper lighting. And it will be not visible to the art, to the public, unfortunately, because it's on a closed floor, but I will be able, I plan to bring groups by, which I will have permission to do. And so that's a, a really a great happy ending to a work that was, I fought for, as you Phyllis know, I fought for it, its existence for about five years, and Mickey Schohoff helped me a great deal there with that. A lot of people helped me. The people in the press were horrified that it was going to be damaged and they came to my defense and wrote articles about it. And it was really quite touching that it had reached that many people. It is a beautiful work. Oh. Yeah. Uh, well, and what's nice about this image is you can see how large it is with the sofas. 30 by 30 feet, oh. right. <laughs> um. Can, Catherine, can we go back to, uh, uh, no, keep going back, one more. Now, in a work like this, Dorothea, um, is it about lines and edges? Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about, about the arcs and the colors and the transparency? Well, yes. Uh, and Phyllis, I think I mentioned this to you on the phone, but I will repeat it. Um, 
There was a woman named Agnesi who lived in Bologna at the end of the 19th century. She came from a wealthy family and she was a, br a brilliant mathematician. And she did the only curve that's been invented since the Greeks, even with computers. Nobody has invented a new curve to my knowledge. And that curve is called the Witch of Agnesi, which isn't that tempting to look into that and <laughs> fool around with it. And I looked at it, I got very excited by it. I didn't exactly understand how to do it. So a friend came and tutored me in mathematics for six months. And yeah, in, in this form of geometry. And at the end of that time, I thought, I don't want to do this mathematically. I want to do it pragmatically. So I drew a circle, I do a square and the golden mean based on that square. And I drew a circle in the square and an ellipse in the golden mean and uh, maintaining the integrity of it all. In other words, no, no shape is being cut and placed on top of another. It's all about topology. And uh, I knew that I wouldn't be able to create a new curve, but I was going to give it a good shot and, and try with, try just for the sheer, intellectual and visual delight of it. And I just love doing this work. Dorothy, it's amazing how you're able to take these concepts and transform them into compelling art. So um, can, can we open to questions? Thank you. Uh, Hello. Yes, we certainly can. Um, what a pleasure it is to listen to you both talk. I was almost in a little bit of a daze there. Um, so first, I'm going to call on Tabitha Soren. Tabitha, I will unmute you and then you can feel free to ask your question. Hi, uh, the exchange was really amazing and I learned a lot about your work that I had no idea about in a very unpretentious way. So thank you for that. I, I felt like the slides shown today are so consistent that um, I was surprised because I think of one of the things I really love about your work is that it's very varied. And I was wondering if in your early life as an artist, if you ever got feedback about it being too varied, too inconsistent, or the palette changing too much, or the materials, or um, I guess I, I've heard other artists um, and heard it to my, heard criticism of my own work as, you know, sort of stay in your lane, stick with what you're good at. And I was wondering if you ever heard things like that, if how you ignored it and uh, continued on. I've heard it all my life and still fear it. Uh, but the thing is, I'm not working for market. Uh, they're talking about marketing. I don't care about, I, I've never worked for marketing. I don't care about that stuff. I think, I think life and being an artist is such a big game. And that is really small potatoes as far as I'm concerned. At, at one point I was going to talk about how you use so many different materials in one piece. It's astonishing. It's like some of the guys on Top Chef. <laughs> well, as you know, I'm devoted to cooking, and I grew up in Montreal with very, very good French food, and I swear that this association in my early life, this was before the Second World War, to food helped me understand how to make art, because um, the people who worked in the kitchen, for instance, would not use day-old butter. They bought the butter fresh every day and there was a whole thing about the butter and you know, we weren't wealthy or anything they would throw butter out that was a day old and you know but you really um, that's like gra grinding cadmium you know there's an association there you know it was always amazing to me that they would put these in different ingredients together and it would come out as a cake like my bedroom was self kitchen I was open and I would listen to them, hear them, and I, I would just, uh, you know, it just all sank in. And then when I went to art school, and of course the food in Montreal wasn't as terrific 
uh, when I went to art school, was an easy translation. And still to this day, when I want to learn about materials, I read cookbooks. I love it. We've never talked about this. Never have, no. <laughs> love it. Uh, I guess uh, let's have another question. Uh, thank you both. Uh, next, we will be going over to Marie. Marie, I'm going to unmute you. Is that me, Marion? Oh, Marion, oh, excuse sorry. me. <laughs> no worries. Hello. Hello. Hi, Dorothea. Thank you for your nice talk. Um, I was wondering uh, about your uh, time at uh, High Times, Hard Times. Uh, I know you were involved in, in that. Um, yeah. It was, of course, uh, yeah, a different era, um, like uh, a more uh, the path to the conceptualism. Um, how was that experience for you and uh, how did people react uh, on your installation? Um, yeah, I, that, that was my question. As a woman, a beautiful young woman, I have to say, I never knew that at the time, but now when I look back at pictures, it was very hard to discern what was flattery and what was just a matter of trying to get into my knickers, most of which <laughs> I mean, I mean, there was certainly, I know that Judd respected my work a great deal, as did Flavin. And there were other people who were not interested in the former. But for the most part, it was very hard. I felt like I was very often being indulged in and not taken seriously because the, the uh, measure of the day really had much more to be with being macho and using Cortan steel and all of that kind of thing. And, uh, and here I am working with paper. Yeah. And I was doing that rather defiantly, I have to say. I, mean, I, did, I could have done Cortan steel. They didn't do their own work. It was steel workers that did it. You know, I could have gone to a steel factory and done that. But, you know, I was saying, you know, there are other ways to look at art and look at the world than to push your muscles around. Okay, thank you. Uh, I loved your work and it was very special to see it at uh, Dia Beacon. So I hope you stay healthy. Thank you. I'm very healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, next, we will head over to Iona. Uh, please correct me if I'm saying your name wrong. I'm going to unmute you. Okay. Hi. Um, no, you said my name pretty good. I'm not thinking about it. Um, this is such a privilege to talk to you, Dorothea. Um, I guess my question was, and I'm just going to read it because I sort of lose my track of thought otherwise. Dorothea, your work has a lot of details but I wouldn't say it's detailed per se. Uh, in your process, how do you balance this attention to minor moments and larger impact in an installation? Thank you. It's interesting that you ask that because in a certain way that came up for me yesterday as I was working. I was listening to Chopin Partitas and uh, as I was listening to them and working in the studio, actually, you asked me earlier, Phyllis, about studying. How did I study? I keep work diaries, as you know, and I keep them religiously. And because I have to track my thinking and track, track my own adventure in a way. And, you know, it has, I, I had some personal things to it, but I really, I'm doing a book just on knot theory now, and the cover would, of it will be a picture of the knot on Tutankhamun's tomb. So, you know, all of that's really interesting. But, but when I was doing the drawing which makes itself, I was listening to those, the first drawing which makes itself, I was listening to those very same partitas. And there's something, uh, there's something in uh, Chopin's work which is uh, both emotional and exacting. And that's, that's where I live, emotional, intellectual, and exacting. Thank you so much for answering that. It's a privilege. I really appreciate it. Um, wonderful. Oh, Jeffrey, are you holding up your hand? 
Oh no, not to us. Never mind. No worries. <laughs> I actually have a question myself. I hope the audience doesn't mind my jumping in. Um, we do have time for a few more questions if anyone would like to um, drop them in the chat while I'm talking. But I, I'm curious about how um, your experience at Black, at Black Mountain and how the exchanges between the other artists there um, were formational to your work, Dorothea. Well, I was very young and I was very unformed, you know, and I was from another country. And I'm trained as a French painter. That's my training. And, and yet I had already a penchant for mathematics and Montreal was at that point pretty intellectually sophisticated. And I ran a room with a rather sophisticated group of writers and artists. And uh, so when I came to Montreal, you know, I'm putting my foot on an unknown continent. So, and, and because I went to a very good, uh, I had very good schooling in Montreal. Um, I was, for instance, I was in Olson, Charles Olson's writing class. And I, at that time could, you know, uh, repeat um, the French writers by heart and things like that. I mean, the when I went into um, Charles Olson's poetry class and wrote poetry, I mean, he, you know, I could write. It, it wasn't it wasn't the writing of a kid. I still have some of that around, uh, at, but you know, the place was just popping, and it was so full of very bright and talented people. As soon as I got there, practically my best friends became Cy Twomley and, and uh, Bob Rauschenberg. And uh, we did a lot of playing together, but then um, we, were, we were the photography class, can you believe it? And, <laughs> and you know, uh, there was something called the Sound Like Movement Workshop and I had, a, I started, uh, ballet when I was four, so I could dance. I was trained a trained dancer. Uh, so the ballet, so the light sound movement workshop was more, more or less a recreation from the Bauhaus of Schlemmer, but it was very, very interesting. And you know, eighteen, God, you're in heaven, you know, <laughs> with things like that. The everyday painters. I thought weren't very good, that is the winter people. They were trying to uh, do abstract expressionism. And I, even in Montreal, I, although I've done my share of abstract expressionist paintings, I mean, I have to confess, but uh, as what Chuck Close said, he did more de Koonings than de Kooning. But uh, I realized even then that the vocabulary was a known vocabulary. And I wanted to eventually invent my own vocabulary. Thank you so much. Um, as somebody who grew up in, in London and, and now lives in America, I, I, I relate to your experience going between countries that don't yeah. seem so far for many people. Well, uh, yeah, it is, a, especially at that age, you know, and I'm coming from a French culture. I grew I more or less grew up French. My father was French. Uh, the name is actually Duracrun, it's French. Uh, yeah, I grew up in a French culture, and here I am at Black Mountain College. I've never experienced racism. My, uh, Canada is not a racist country. Uh, I didn't know uh, why people were uh, looking on black people differently than white people. It wasn't at all uh, discernible to me where all, how, so it was all new some good, some bad, as I said, yeah. I mean, for instance, I knew Mordecai Richter in Montreal. So we were, you know, I knew good writers and I was listening and I was also skipping a lot of high school classes and going to college with my ne then boyfriend. And that, that was really terrific because high school was boring and college was exciting. <laughs> learning about Nicholas of Cusa and people like that. I mean, you know, when I was 13. <laughs> uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a bunch of questions coming in here, but before I start calling on more, I'm going to hand over to Fong for a moment. Um, PB, you want me to unmute you? You're, you're... Oh, I think you have to do it. <laughs> I don't do that. 
Hi. Oh, there's Fong. Hi, Fong. Hi. I, I just want to take this moment to share with our readers and viewers that how much Lothia meant to the rail from the very beginning when she was the on the board, protecting my vision, protecting the vision of the rail being free, protecting the vision of the rail as a form of broader social unity. She understood how much I admire her work and also the philosophy of Black Mountain College, where it's not being specialized in one field, but overlapping many. Yes. But I would like to take this opportunity to share also a few bits of about Biker Gallery, apart from the historical fact that it was one of the most radical galleries that show amazing roster of artists, brilliant artists, as you and, and Dorothea mentioned, Phyllis Rice Martin, David Norrell, Bill Bollinger, Joe Zucker, Chuck Close, Mary Liver, I can go on, Paul Magenson, but also there's people oh, like Mary Boone, people oh. like Linda Banglas, Conrad Lee Wallen, who also have their uh, you know, career started from there. Um, you know, again, I like to, to refer to this as relational continuity. Again, a form of spreading the power of art and culture as a broader form of social unity, like the real philosophy and whatnot. The reason, however, Biker Gallery is called Biker because it was found by Klaus Curtis and Jeff Myers who were roommates at Yale University's undergrads, and Jeff Byers' first two letters of his last name, plus Klaus Curtis, four letters of his last name. And that's how Michael Gallery's name came from. Uh, I want to take this to, to make another beautiful continuity. David Golantis, in 1968, started Two Tree Management, and his partner, was Jeff Byers. So as you know, some of you do know that I'm on the board of the shop, what used to be called shop, a Marie Walsh Shop Foundation studio program. I joined the board when we moved from Tribeca. Ah. The year that Dorothea was there when her studio was being restored, that's how we met also, 2006. It, we moved to Dumbo and, you know, David Golenka's Two Tree Manager became our landlord, but by 2014, Joy Robinson, Chuck Close, Urban Sandler, and I met up uh, with David and Jane, appealed to the idea that if they were to be willing, considering merge their name, which a form of immortalization, <laughs> like the equivalent of, you know, Lorenzo de Medici of some sort, uh, in return, we don't pay them rent. And that's how the shop will lend us. Because of David will lend us relationship to Jeff Byers, his love for art, and this go for Jane will lend us too. And that, to me, is one of the most luminous things that can be done. And we need more residency like the shop will lend us. And it had roots again through Jeff Byers and Klaus Curtis and Dorothea Rockburn and I just want to share that with you all so you understand what the rail is trying to do with our friends. We need to work together from now on. That's all. Sorry, long winded historical facts. <laughs> Thank you, Fong. Um, the history is important and we appreciate that you're still so active in our community, Dorothea. So the questions have rolled in. Next, I'm going to head over to Catherine Hart, who sort of combines Christina's question, which was, do you prefer creating site-specific works? So I'm going to unmute you. Hi, Catherine. Hi, thank you so much. Um, it's such a privilege to have this time with you, Dorothea. Um, I saw your show in Thea and last September and it's still rolling around in my head. Um, uh, my question is about the specificity of placement in relation to the space that you have with some of your work. Some of them are placed directly on the floor. Um, some of them are high up. Um, I guess the question is twofold. One of them is, um, are these pieces always placed that way or was it specifically for Dia? And also when you're creating these pieces, do you have it, this idea in your mind of how it's going to be placed? Well, um, good question, thank you. Uh, 
as, as you know, I, as I said, I was trained as a dancer plus a Black Mountain. I studied with um, Merce Cunningham and then when I came to New York, I was part of Judson Dance Theater. So I'm a trained dancer. Uh, I mean, now that I'm old, I don't dance anymore, but uh, you know, my body moves in space in other words. I have a familiarity with moving in space. And so uh, while there is a general kind of idea about works like domain of the variable and how they occupy a room, it, it really has to do with the, uh, the units that are used in the room. It also has to do with the way my body perceives the space and also who I'm working with. The Dia installation was done with uh, Heidi Giannotti, who is the head of uh, design there and oversees all of the installations and she is an artist herself. She was a sculptor, doesn't practice anymore, but she is a very, uh, very much in tune with the language I was talking about. So when I explained units, she made certain suggestions which were excellent and, uh, and she also, I mean, there are aspects of that work that are very hard to do in the domain of the variable like the board that's pulled down is going to pull down off the wall. I have to say we tested that probably different ways probably about 20 times and that's like when you're working on a budget and a time frame that's kind of a, uh, hard for me to ask somebody but no problem with Heidi. She just yeah, rolled up her sleeves and jumped right in all the time as did the, the crew that she was working with. They were marvelous to work with but I love that I want a body experience from art, not necessarily the one that I give because I've in the in the rooms because I feel like I give that body experience in the Pascal paintings as well. I mean, you you encompass those with your body. And by the way, um, John Van Doren gave a Pascal painting to Dia, and they bought one. And I'm going to loan them one. So eventually we're going to have, uh, they're making a room for me, which takes time and money because the Pascal paintings have to have artificial light. They can't be, they're not made to be seen in sunlight. It doesn't, there's kind of stars in the night. So all of this is eventually going to happen and uh, we're all thrilled about it. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful. I think, Christine, I'm going to allow you to join join into this conversation as you had related comments. Thank you. Thanks, Dorothea. It was a pleasure to see you and Phyllis. Um, I had the honor of working with um, Dorothea on a show at Guildhall Museum years ago that I treasure those memories. Um, and uh, she was just our Lifetime Achievement Award winner, and I've worked with Phyllis. So it's a pleasure. This has been a great conversation. Um, my question is, we had done a site-specific mural for Guildhall, and the site-specific mural, again, um, it was a, it was a for me, when we had to take it down, we had to paint over it, it was like tragic. Um, a lot of these paintings that are meant to be sh sh seen on the blue wall, uh, which we've displayed that way, uh, I know that at times people show it on a different color. How do you feel about that, um, Dorothea? I don't like it. <laughs> it's not the work. It has to be seen the way it was made to be seen. Like Most museums, of course, will uh, will agree to that. But in private homes, how does that? How do you feel about that? Same way. If you're going to buy the work, you have to display it exactly as it was meant to be displayed. Dark. It's stars in the night, as I said, and that's how the color keying works. And if you color key it off a white wall, it doesn't look like uh, the colors don't resonate in the same way. It, they really, I, they really have the color in that work and the dark blue walls. But hi, Christina. <laughs> uh, what, two children later? <laughs> uh, but, it, you know, the, the um, way in which the color works is based on mannerist painting. Now, it is my pet belief that Pantormo is the beginning of modern art. 
And the way he used color is really extraordinary. And I studied Pantormo in depth, and I still study Pantormo, and those works are color keyed according to Pantormo. Magnificent works. Thank the you. show was fantastic. My heart was taken down too, by the way. <laughs> Wait, you're saying that Pascal works relate to Pantormo? Yes. Holy, I, I, it's the first time I'm hearing this. You heard it here live. Uh, <laughs> next, I'm going to head over to, thank you, Christina, to Zeb. Zeb, I'm going to unmute you, and please let us know if that's not your correct name. <laughs> Zeb for Sebastian. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Dorothea, for, I don't know, this is just amazing. I remember as a student just going to see your work at the moment, so I feel very lucky and privileged. Um, well, my question kind of relates to, um, you talked about math and astrology. Astronomy. Uh, Never astrology. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, astronomy. Um, I wonder whether like philosophy or, you know, existentialism, if that's something that empire, inspires you as well, um, and perhaps why? French philosophy in particular, but also Husserl and to a degree Heidegger, but I really can't understand Heidegger as much as I try. It really kind of runs a blank. I probably need a good teacher or something. <laughs> but definitely Merleau-Ponty and the French philosophers. I mean, as I said, I grew up French. And um, I see like uh, maybe like the this notion of like the past and the present and the future like these notions of time um especially like in the works that i saw at the moma um i don't even remember how long ago but like the placement of the body 11. what's that 2000 oh moma was 2013 14. okay can you maybe talk about like the plate like the body and how that kind of relates to well, first of all, I'd like to, you know, talk a little bit about the question you bring up about time. Now, I always thought that the most interesting thing about art was that the painting that was done in Egyptian tombs was as viable today as it was when it was done. Now, nothing else seems to succeed through time the way art does. And I don't know why that is, you know, but it's fascinating to me. And even though often you see work in different countries like African uh, cave paintings or something like that, and they're, you know, they could have been done yesterday by you, you know, it's so viable. And that's something to do with the fact that we are all more human beings. Sense the world through our emotional sensors, and I find that, and and then we we turn that into art, and I find that absolutely fascinating, especially at this time through the pandemic, because most people I talk to, including myself, you say, "What are you doing? Are you working?" They say, "No, I'm cleaning." <laughs> Everybody's, I, I haven't cleaned this place since 9-11. <laughs> like all the, all the nooks and crannies. But what I'm doing, I've always said, you know, that to myself, I've always said, to make art, you have to be prepared to make it. It's not spontaneous. At least with me, it's not spontaneous. And and so I'm I'm beginning to work now a little bit, but I'm keeping the these work diaries that I make that really describe what's going on in my life and my mind, you know, with art, math, articles from math books and so on. It's really a record for myself because I don't know who I am in this sense. The Dorothea of two weeks ago is different than the Dorothea of today. And certainly the Dorothea of, you know, 15 years ago, entirely different. The mom Dorothea, very, very different. And I want that record of who I am. And that's why I do work diaries. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I believe we have a question from Michaela. Um, Michaela, I will unmute you. 
Michaela. <laughs> <laughs> Ciao, Dorothea. I want. Wow. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs> so good to see you so well. Yeah. So I'm in Italy now. I'm in Verona. Yes. I wondered how you were, were because Italy yeah. experienced the pandemic so badly. And I was thinking about you and I wanted to email you, but I'm very bad at <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. And Italy is not so bad. You know, papers and news are what they are. So, Dorothea, what do you think about uh, art? Uh, and you are such a visionary, open-minded, wonderful person. So apart from cleaning, <laughs> what do you think about art and what is going to be? I'm not sure that I understand the question. You mean my art and when is it going to yes. be? Yes, yes. Well, I'm doing this book on the studies of knots, you know, and, and I'm doing all this mathematics mm -hmm. on the studies of knots. And it's, as I say, it's worth looking. You don't have to know math, math, mathematics to understand knot theory. It's worth looking up on YouTube because these brilliant mathematicians, and they're passionate, and it's great to see their passion, and also the fact that they know what they're drawing. So, you know, what I'm doing, as I said, is preparing to, to work, and I'm just, I'm starting to work a little bit, along with knot theory, and uh, very, very involved with it, is something called entanglement, and I'm doing some, I'm doing a small entanglement work for a friend, actually. And, uh, you know, I'm beginning to, feel like making work and I hadn't I, I, the pandemic threw me off my pins as I guess it did everybody else and I have to say the great deal the great thing about doing this interview is seeing people yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen anybody for so long yeah. I'm, you know I'm you know I still have my big bad beautiful black cat oh wow <laughs> I'm watching a lot of math programs on YouTube. I'm studying. I'm, and I, you know, there's an aspect of this which is quite beautiful. There's no traffic on Grand Street. There's usually the degree of debris in this loft because it's cast iron building and it's open is formidable. I mean, you put, you know, your finger on it freshly white down table and it's filthy. Uh, no debris. It's amazing. Just amazing. And when I go to the small park, you know that park at on Lafayette and Spring Street? Uh, Michaela has a house quite near there. Uh, when I go to that park for the first time in 50 years, I can hear birds singing. <laughs> And that is quite amazing. And, you know, I talked to other people about this and they're saying the same thing that the cherry blossoms were all out in my daughter's neighborhood. And because there's nobody around, the cherry blossoms all fell to the ground and the ground was pink, you know, things like this. We're seeing nature take over. And also I've seen pictures of black bears on the lawn at Dia Beacon. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that wonderful to see that nature is, is always kind of struggling to make its own path. And I just do hope that when this is all over, we don't go, go back to fossil fuels because mm -hmm. it's very clear how damaging they are to us as human beings, to our health and to nature. Trees could, cannot no longer have the ability to clean up after fossil fuels because there's too much of it. And not, you know, planes are the worst, the worst um, violators and there are hardly any planes, so there's no pollution. It's interesting. Michaela, so good to see you. <laughs> Can we Skype in the few next few days? Sure. I will write to you. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Good. <laughs> um, how wonderful it is to see friends reuniting here. Jeffrey, is your finger, is it for me? I, I'm going to unmute you. Thank you. You're live. Thank you. Hi, Dorothea. It's great to see you. And I uh, was thumbing through a book of Yanis Zanakis yesterday and just by chance thought of you because of some of the drawings that he did for Le Corbusier when he worked uh, for Le Corbusier and wondered um, about your interest in music 
Uh, you mentioned working and thinking to Chopin just a little bit earlier. Uh, but back at Black Mountain uh, and in the uh, New York City of, of the 70s, um, how important was music then and how important is it in your work uh, to this day? Well, one of the things that happened to me when I was in the South was that I had no, I, you know, I was used to going to classical concerts in Montreal and sort of Alouetta, you know, that was my musical background. And when I was at Black Mountain, uh, first of all, I was studying music with a, a singing with a woman named Mrs. Yalowitz. And so I was beginning, I could read music, but I was beginning to understand what the voice could do. Now there was a, a watering hole near Black Mountain called Peaks. And there was a buzz around that we should, I mean, first of all, I went there previously. The first, and there was a lot of old white farmers were the music. And the first time I went, they were playing, it was a jug band. You know, this is, I mean, this girl from Montreal, you know, this is so new. The second time I went, it was washboard band. And it was these old farmers who were, I mean, they were really into it. And there was no liquor at Peaks. You had to bring your own. Now, there was a whole buzz around the college that somebody was coming to Peaks and we all had to go. And as I said, I had no idea of American popular culture because before TV, you know, and not even, I mean, radio in Canada was the CBC and BBC. So I went to Peaks along with everybody else. And this young man got up and sang, and it was Elvis Presley. And he must have been 19, and he said, I remember to this day, he sang Blue Moon. And I couldn't believe it, I just, because I'm studying music, and I, I could understand the licenses he was taking, the way in which he was uh, uh, using his voice. I knew all the innuendos by this time. And it was, a, and, a, and he, he finished his rounds, and then he, got in his truck and drove away because I think he was just doing these like one night stands or something then and then so there's still all these these old farmers in the audience and they're pissed off they're really pissed off and why are they pissed off not because he was wiggling his hips or anything because he's using an electric guitar nobody used electric guitars yet isn't that interesting and then when I came to New York I started seeking out black music. And I had another interesting experience. I mean, I went to the library, borrowed a lot of records and so, but I had this other interesting firsthand experience. And that was, there was somebody named Norman Solomon at Black Mountain, he came to visit me. I was at a horrible marriage. And he said, well, you're not working, come work in my studio. And I, he said, if you could arrange babysitting, arrange the babysitting. And a day before I was to go, he called me up and he said, I gave another quarter of my loft to a musician. I hope it doesn't uh, interfere with you. And I kind of called him, you know. But I, I, so I said, well, I'll try. And if it does, I won't do it. So I went and this musician was uh, playing um, over and over uh, again. And uh, I think it's a tenor sax. I'm not sure, quite sure of the instruments that you blow into. And he played the same thing over and over again. And it was Charlie Parker. Now, 1968, no white bread knew about Charlie Parker. You know, nobody knew about or what the bird was synonymous for. Nobody knew any of that language, of course. But I listened to him play. And I swear, I learned how to be an artist while listening because he did the phrase, same phrase over and over again. And then he, like in a drawing, you know, the way you erase something and then you put something else in, it was like that. And, and I listened to him like for half a year. So that's part of my musical experience. I also went to a lot of concerts in New York. That's amazing. That's such a wonderful story. Thanks, Dorothea. Uh, thank you. I believe we have one more question from Mark. Mark, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, can you hear us? Me? Yes, Mark. Hi. Oh, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, first of all, I want to say this has been a spectacular 
uh, conversation, it seems really well orchestrated. It seems, you know, like uh, there was a lot of planning with the questions um, and the presentation. Um, I'm, that's not really my question, but I am curious about that because this has been really a standout presentation. I've watched almost every single one here at the rail. That's why, I'm sorry, but that's why this was better done because I watched some of them and I thought, I'm going to do better. So that, that was, thank okay. you. I uh, appreciate well, it. Well, it shows. Thank uh, you. Uh, my question was just about your installation in what I call the AT&T building. I guess Sony commissioned it, not AT&T. No, AT&T uh, and Sony had taken it over. So yeah. it is the AT&T building. Yes, uh, uh, I still call the American Craft Museum the American Craft Museum. Um, uh, but can you, there were some things hanging in that space that seemed very much related to uh the the piece but i wondered if 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 they were designed by you and if you could talk a little bit about them they were very beautiful this by the way that installation is just magnificent Thank i'm you. so glad you've worked so hard to preserve it and i'm sorry i asked earlier where it, where it was in the building it looked like it was in the top of the building because of the circular window Second. or what Second. Second floor. That's, okay, yeah, there was that other one too. Um, I've been in that, they have the most beautiful elevators in that building too. Um, what can you talk about the, the three-dimensional elements that complemented the, the, the frescoes? I don't know what you mean by three-dimensional elements. Can we go to the slide? Can we go back to the slide? Um, I oh great. It's way at the beginning. Yeah. This there. is like a trip down memory lane. Another one. Oh, look there. Yeah, the first one is a, is a, even better. The first is this the first image? You see, there's some things hanging in the space. It's the very last one. One more. Back. In the end. In the end. One more, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, I had a question about this one too. These these marks, I would love to know the process of developing those those beautiful curves and marks. I guess you talked a little bit about this, the curves. I'm going to have to do some research on that. I'm very curious. But in the space, there was this this shot that we looked at earlier. There's pieces hanging in the in the room were those do you know about those too they do you, i can't i don't know how i can't uh do you see they're like mobiles hanging in that room those have no relation to you or your work no uh uh i mean they actually relate very beautifully but so then i'll modify my question and can you can you you talk a lot about mathematics and you did mention this one curve and in this in these frescoes there are these delicate lines in the fresco i'm wondering if they're embedded brass or if they are actually painted and they're drawn. It, what they're drawn okay and can you can you talk, you said that you did a ton of planning for this piece yeah. is is so there was these are not gestural marks these are very carefully planned out marks yes they're following uh, you know um you know the way the side of a ship looks uh, with a slight curve so it can go out the water go through the water easily like the prow of a ship is curved on either side hello mm. yes okay so that's called that's one part of a ship curve now I took a ship curve and had them enlarged. And um, this, these marks are all formed from ship curves. Now the small circles are the nucleus of the beginning of the curve very often. Uh, but you know, the curve is, is small and large at the same time. And 
you know, obviously we were working on scaffolding to do this. And, uh, you know, different colors represented different energies. I think we were a crew of six. And I was, when you work with other people, you never know how work is gonna come out. Uh, but I was thrilled with the way it did come out because nobody, nobody's hand shows. Uh, the 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 movement of the sky is recorded the sky's energy is recorded in a very uh sort of subtle i mean it's kind of like a chopin partita you know it's it's just it moves and it moves under its own force and that's what i wanted to present a source of energy moving under its own force Thank you. What a beautiful image. I hope someday this will be more readily available to the public. Well, as I say, the people who own the building now are a, are a very nice group of people. Sorry, their name is, uh, is, is not American, so it's hard for me to remember. Um, and they are not in the building uh, business. They don't buy and sell buildings. So it's going to remain in their company, you know, for a long, long time. And um, they are, the woman who owns the company uh, loves the work and did a lot to protect it. And that was, you know, after such a fight with, you know, uh, Isaac Stern wanting to build uh something in front of it, other people wanting to take it down because the elevators would go there very nicely. It was really being a fight. Um, but as I said, I had a lot of help in protesting. A lot of people in the press came to my aid and, and they loved the work and so on. And this uh, company now that owns, I, be I believe in that they will really cherish it and keep it, but it won't be open to the public. But I think if you get in touch with their press people, once it does open, then it would be possible to bring a group there under supervision, of course. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. And now is the moment, um, as is traditional at the rail, that we read a poem in order to close our, our, lunchtime, our lunchtime community moment. So I am going to hand you over to Malika, who is one of our production assistants, and will be reading a poem. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, today I'm going to be reading a poem by the Irish poet Evan Boland, who uh, passed away yesterday. Um, Which is the name? title is Atlant. I'll put it in the chat. Evan Boland, Irish firecracker of a poet okay and um tyler will drop a link shortly uh the title of the poem is atlantis a lost sonnet how on earth did it happen i used to wonder that a whole city arches pillars colonnades not to mention vehicles and animals had all one fine day gone under i mean i said to myself the world was small then surely a great city must have been missed I miss our old city, white pepper, white pudding, you and I meeting under fan lights and low skies to go home in it. Maybe what really happened is this. The old fable makers searched hard for a word to convey that which is gone forever and never found it. And so in the best traditions of where we come from, they gave their sorrow a name and drowned it. Um, and this is from her collection, Domestic Violence. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dorothea and Phyllis. It's been a true honor to have you leading us today. Um, and I hope to see everybody soon. Tomorrow we will have uh, Norma Cole and her poetry collective. Um, and so if anyone needs some soul sustenance, I highly recommend you join us at 1 p.m. Thank you, Dorothea. Thank you, uh, my computer almost died. I had to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bella.